We will give a, a, a talk uh, that will uh, uh, be around 30 minutes or a bit more. Uh, and um, yeah, then we'll go to uh, the next part, which is a Q&A. And this will be via Slido. And as always, I will be uh, sharing the, the link uh, over here. For those who follow us live, uh, they can ask, actually ask questions during the talk and then we'll be answering them uh, right after. And uh, then we'll go into a discussion part where anyone uh, can join. Actually, you can already uh, join the uh, Zoom uh, and mute yourself when you do and you're not speaking. And I will share uh, the link uh, in the YouTube channel. Uh, if you don't see it, you can refresh uh, the page and you'll, you'll find it. Uh, so I'll, I'll enter that in a few minutes. Uh, let's check if everything is fine with the sound. Oh, yeah, it so sounds super fine, apparently. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, all again, uh, either live or afterwards on YouTube. It seems like a lot of people like to watch that afterwards. I'm pretty happy that uh, this reaches more people too. Um, and uh, yeah, we are uh, talking as always uh, about what is intelligence and everything around it, consciousness, attention, uh, and also AI. And um, that, uh, that kind of uh, part of uh, uh, science that groups everything and discusses deeply about this topic uh, might be missing on YouTube and, and so on. So uh, if you are uh, isolated and want to think about these things, well, welcome to uh, uh, Crossroads. So um, we are, uh, uh, we, the organizers of this event, are Cross Labs um, that lives under uh, Cross Compass, the AI company. And uh, what we do at Cross Labs is uh, we do exactly this kind of research. So we uh, think about, well, uh, brain science, different disciplines of mind, uh, AI, neural nets, uh, distributed cognition, uh, meta learning, a lot of different things, artificial life too. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is really broad, but we really think that by approaching intelligence in many different aspects, we can understand it better. Uh, so uh, we organized this event with Antoine Pasquali, Katsunobu Suzuki, uh, so our CEO at uh, Cross Compass, uh, and also a bunch of volunteers that I want to thank uh, for co-organizing this. And uh, yeah, tonight I have the pleasure of introducing um, uh, so Professor Yukiya Nagai, uh, who is now at the University of Tokyo at a very nice, uh, brand new, uh, almost brand new uh, center uh, which is the International Research Center for Neurointelligence. Am I saying that right? Oh. <laughs> uh, so it seems like well, the center is doing so many interesting things. And uh, now they have you, which is uh, really awesome. And I met you uh, a few years back when we, mm -hmm. uh, we had the, this uh, very nice summer school uh, about consciousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were uh, one, of the, uh, one of the instructors and one of the organizers, right? Um, for uh, yeah, for also some practical uh, projects, and uh, this was a this was a great event. I had uh, I had a lot of fun there, and uh, uh, yeah, this is this is a bit coming out of uh, this kind of brand of of a series of events also uh, together with White House also that we had in New York uh, or the Consciousness Club that uh, Lyota Kanai uh, was uh, organizing here, and it's it's still restarted also. I invite you to join also those events. Very fun. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you uh, uh, have a great, really broad uh, experience in studying the mind. Uh, it's very impressive that you work on, well, neural networks, models, uh, uh, on learning, uh, like uh, cognitive functions, uh, uh, what is self, other uh, cognition, also studying emotions, intentions, uh, I think altruism also, which is one of my <laughs> favorite topics. Um, and uh, also predictive coding, which we are going to talk about tonight, connected to different uh, areas. Um, so I think you have very special work in, uh, so maybe I shouldn't spoil too much, but uh, on uh, autism uh, spectrum disorder. Uh, and yeah, that's very exciting that you are using very new approaches to tackle that. Uh, okay, so I shouldn't spoil maybe too much of that. Uh, we are really happy to have you tonight and uh, yeah, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, share your slides and you have as much uh, time as uh, uh, you want, like feel comfortable. Everyone knows like this is a very relaxed event and uh, yeah, already feel free to ask questions during the, the, the event, mm -hmm. everyone. Um, and we'll be uh, going through those on Slido. I'll share the link in a moment. Vicky and I, please, uh, anytime. 
Thank you very much, Ola, for a very kind introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot see your faces, but I hope that you enjoy, you will enjoy my talk today. And uh, as Olaf said, my research interest in the human intelligence as well as an artificial intelligence. And my research lab has been developing the many computational models for understanding the human intelligence. So the, in the, today's talk, I'd like to share our latest activities, which focuses on the predictive coding account. I think they are, sorry, there. Let me share the screen again. Yeah. So I guess that there are many of you are familiar with the survey of code predictive coding, which is now attracting their increasing attention in the field of their developmental robotics, as well as in the newer sciences. And we have been the, uh, investigating to what extent this predictive coding survey provides a unified account for the cognitive development. So I'd like to show you our the computational studies as also their uh, analysis of their human behaviors. The main research question is that what is the principle of the cognitive development? As I said, I have been developing the many different types of the computational neural network models, which enable robots to learn and develop like in human babies. But then the many people actually ask a lot of questions. There, in the, from the computational approach, we can design the many different types of model and the all types of models can somehow there are replicate the human-like development. But then the, what is their core principle or core mechanism of such a development. For example, you can see here there are pictures. One pictures, there are babies is exploring the object and he is learning how to manipulate an object. And this the self-exploration abilities, of course, enables first the babies to acquire its own motor the behaviors and also the internal model to generate the goal-directed actions. And then the interesting way this their abilities which were acquired through the non-social their interactions can be are extended to the social behaviors for example the life side you can see that the, the child is cooperating with their uh, his fathers in the cooperations the child has to infer the intention of others and also uh, sometimes help the other persons so the first question is how does the continuity in the development from non-social behavior to the social behavior can be explained by the unified account? And another interest aspect is their individual diversity in the development. As you know that some children have difficulties in acquiring the cognitive abilities, for example, the autism spectrum disorder, which is a type of the developmental disorder. They show difficulties in, for example, the in inferring their intention of other persons or their uh, emotional, their uh, synthesis. So the question is, is there any the unified principle that can account for both the continuity and the diversity in the development? And if there is such a principle, can we make a computational model based on such a principle? And as you know that there are many neuroscientists have recently they are investigating their predictive coding as a unified theory of the human brain and also the human cognition. Here, the key idea is that there, our brain works as a predictive machine and the brain always try to minimize the prediction error. Here, the figure illustrates how the brain works. The brain is supposed to have the internal model, which is acquired through our own motor experiences. And then there, with this internal model, we perceive the world and also act on the environment. First, when we perceive the world, we of course receive the sensory input from the environment through the vision, audio, tactiles, and many different modalities. The, here, the, important, the first important point is that the bottom-up sensory signal it's not just simply utilized for the recognition, but our internal model always produces that prediction signals. And then the predicted signal and the bottom-up sensory signals are integrated 
in order to minimize the prediction error. For example, that if our internal model needs to be updated, we can utilize these prediction errors to uh, refine our internal model to make a better predictions. And the same ideas can be also applied for the action generations, which is so-called the action in active inference. From our body, we can receive the proprioceptive sensation, which is uh, information about our body. And then there are, uh, according to this predictive coding theory, there are our motor behaviors is also generated through the minimization of prediction error. We receive the sensation about the body and as well the, as their uh, internal model make the prediction about the proprioceptive sensation. And the error between the bottom of sensation and the top down prediction is used to update our motor signal, which result in their actions into the action there in the environment. And one more interesting and important the idea is that their uh, process to minimize the prediction error and also to perceive the work and also to act on the world, we follow the blame follows their uh, Bayesian inference, the ideas. Here, the bottom up sensations as well as their top down flyers are expressed as a Gaussian distribution which suggesting that our prior or the predictions has some uncertainty, which is represented as the distributions of the Gaussian, the, uh, sorry, the diversities of the distributions. And then their sensory signals also received with some noises, which is represented as a red Gaussian distributions. And then there, uh, according to the Bayesian inference, our posterior or perception is generated as an, by integrating the bottom up sensation and the top down prior signals depends on the, how certain its signals are. This is a very nice theory, and then the, we are also we also believe that the, our human brain is nicely explained by this model. So I'd like to show you some computational models based on the predictive coding. But before going to their uh, computational studies, I'd like to test their how your brain also works as a predictive machine. This is a very well known the optical illusion. You can see the green uh, cylinder placed on the checkerboard. Here, I want you to uh, focus on the regions A and B. And the question is, which square A or B looks brighter? I guess many of you would answer that B looks brighter for you. Maybe because there's B corresponds to the white regions on the checkerboard. So even under the shadow, the B still looks brighter for you. But at the physical, the stimuli level, these two regions actually have the exactly the same brightness. So that the physical stimuli or the sensation, their A and the B have the equivalent their brightness information. So this perception really are demonstrating that how your brain makes their predictions about the world and the, how you integrate the bottom of sensation with the top down, the sensory, uh, the top down predictive signals. So based on this idea, we have been designing their several computational models. So first, I'd like to show you their uh, computational studies, which first focusing on their developmental continuity from non-social behavior to social behavior. As a target task, here we focused on their mirror neuron systems. The mirror neuron system as is their uh, brain areas or brain, the neural groups, which activate both when executing the action and also when observing the other person's actions. And we think that this mirror neurons is a kind of the uh, origin of the social behavior because this neuron groups alerts us to our uh, nothing, what the other persons are feeling or what other persons are thinking based on our own, their internal models. So our the research the challenge was to uh, design the computational neural network model, which can replicate the development of the mirror neural system. To address this uh, question, we introduced the deep autoencoder. 
The deep autoencoder, the most important function of the deep autoencoder is to uh, acquire the rated state, which has the lower dimension than the input and output signal. Here, the robot, which is the, uh, equipped with the deep autoencoder, learns to generate the reaching behavior. So this robot can receive the visual signal from the cameras and also the tactile sensation when the robot touches the object and also the proprioceptive signal from the robot body. And these the three the much model signals are fed into this deep autoencoder. And then the deep autoencoder is trained to uh, replicate, uh, reproduce their input signal as an output. And then the, here the interesting point or important point is that the, as the deep autoencoder has the lower dimension in the middle layer, we can expect that this middle layer, the radiant space would acquire the much model representation of the region behavior, which integrate visual tactile and the proprioceptive signals. And then there are, after we train this network, we utilize this the much model representations for the robots to uh, infer the intention or the goal of other persons, their reaching behavior. Here we introduce the green eye cup, which is now reaching for the object. And the blue eye cup, which was learned this the deep autoencoder, is just watching the green robot. So the observation means that this blue robot can basically observe or receive the visual signal from the cameras. The robot is just observing the green robot reaching for an object. But interestingly, as this deep autoencoder acquired the multimodal representation in the middle layer, so we can expect that this network would, uh, imagine, would make the, uh, imaginary signals for the tactile and the proprioceptive signal as well as the visual signal. And this imaginary the created signal can be used as an imaginary input to the network. And then this recursive connections can enhance their, uh, also the improve their accuracy of the prediction in the visual the signal. And with this, their architectures, this network can work as a mirror neural system because this network, which was trained through the all motor behavior is now utilized for estimating their goal of other persons or other robots' behaviors by incorporating the, its own motor experiences. So to verify our, our hypothesis, we conducted a comparative experiment. We designed the two conditions. In one condition, the robot that learned the network, the March model deep autoencoder using their, uh, its own motor generation experiences, which mean that the robot could utilize the visual, tactile, and the proprioceptive signal during the training. And in the comparative condition, we let the network learn only through their action observation, which means that the network could receive only the visual signal as an input and the train to predict the visual signal. Here you can see that how, the, how well the network could uh, predict their goal of the another robot, their region behavior. And the green bar shows their improvement of their collect prediction ability. As you can see that their action generation condition, of course, can nicely improve their uh, prediction ability as it uh, proceeds their learning. And then you can also see that their in collect predictions. So sometimes, especially in the beginning of training, network is confused whether the target object is a left or right. In that case, there are this kind of their incorrect prediction is observed in the network as a network result. And then there are the comparisons of with their action observation condition nicely demonstrate that how the generation experiences are contributed to the better performance in the accuracy. And as we use the network, we could also uh, analyze the internal representation of the network in order to see how well there are uh, different the reaching behavior are structured in the network. This is a principal component analysis space, and you can see three lines which correspond to the reaching 
different uh, vision behavior for different three object. And you can see that on the left side, there in the actual generation conditions, the network could acquire very nicely structured the internal representation, whereas there uh, such a nice structure could not observe in the action observation. So this result nicely suggests that their own motor experiences, on their experiences of generating and learning the actions would be uh, very important, their mechanism for acquiring the mirror neural system. We can test their, uh, this network model to further uh, extend how, whether the helping behavior or artistic behaviors can also be generated based on this prediction ability. Here, the, this robot was trained to uh, train with the two the action primitives. One is to cover the red marker. The other is to push the blue cup. And then the robot first observed what the person is trying to do. And so you can see in the robot vision that the robot, uh, the human hand is there detected. But then the, if the robot see some of the prediction errors, which is a discrepancy between their trained behavior patterns and the observed behavior patterns, the prediction error gradually increases, which triggers the robot's own actions to minimize the prediction error. This behaviors nicely correspond to the active inference. By acting on the environment, the robot can minimize the prediction errors. So we suggest that based on this experiment, that the social behavior, such as an altruistic or the helping behaviors could also emerge based on the very simple idea of the prediction error minimization. And then the next experiment, we focused on the emotion ability. Emotion is a quite different from their helping or their reaching behaviors, but we think that the same idea, the March model predictive learning can be applied to the acquisition of emotion and also their estimation of other person's emotions. Here we introduce the March model deep belief network. The architecture is very similar to deep old encoder. We just put their input and the output side to the same side so that they're just one their network can do their perception and also their prediction. Here, the first, the robot observes the human facial expressions as a visual signal and the hand movement and their speed signal as an audio signal. And then the network were trained to minimize their prediction error. The network has first their uh, input signal is fed into the uh, in the bottom up way and then through the highest layer the network generate or reconstruct the original the input signal and then by minimizing the error between the incoming signal and the reconstructed signal the network can uh, self organizes the internal representation this is the first result where we investigated how the emotional, different emotional st state are gradually uh, separated in the highest layer of the network. The color marker corresponds to the different emotional state. And uh, from the very beginning of training to the end of training, you can see that there in the very beginning of training, the robot cannot differentiate the different the emotional state, although the signals are different. Then there, as learning processes, proceed, the robot nicely they acquire the distributed the emotional state, which corresponds to the alorsal axis and the pleasant axis. This is a development of differentiation of the emotional state, which is they also observed in the impact emotion development. And then we of course tested whether this their own internal model can be utilized to uh, estimate the other persons in this case, the human's emotional state. When we train the network, we provided the all modality signals. And then there, this is again, their internal representation of the network. After the training, the robot received only the auditory signal as an input. It's like in the high the eyes. And then the robot just uh, listened to the speech and then imagined what kind of emotional expressions are uh, shown by their facial expressions or the hand gesture by the humans. This result nicely showed that there are uh, this deep 
belief network can utilize their reconstruction or generation abilities to better estimate the emotional state of their humans. The very first estimation only using the auditory signal is very far from the truth value. But then by repeating their imaginary or imagination of their visual signal, and they utilize these imaginary signals at virtual input to refine their estimations, the network could improve the accuracy of the estimation and we get closer to the truth value after the 20s uh, estimations. This result again showing that the, how their prediction and the reconstruction ability of our human brain can be utilized not only for generating our own action, but also they're uh, estimating their internal state of the other persons. So the first part was about their uh, continuity in the development, how non-social behaviors can reach to their, lead to their social behaviors. Now I want to focus on the individual diversities in the development. I again go back to the uh, predictive coding idea. So this is the same illustration from the previous slide. Now I like to introduce a very interesting hypothesis proposed by the neuroscientists. The neuroscientists have already suggested that there are differences between the typically developed persons and the person with autism spectrum disorders can be explained by the differences in this uh, process of the Bayesian inference. The one well-known hypothesis is called hypoplier hypothesis. So the top shows their Bayesian inference, their process for the typical developed persons. Here you can see that their prior, the predictions have their larger variances. That's why their posterior becomes get closer to the sensory signal. This is a very nice, their uh, intuitively understandable hypothesis because it explained why the persons with autism spectrum disorders often have their hypersensory sensitivity. I found that, that this is a very nice starting point, but still there are of course there are many open questions. To what extent this hypothesis can ex explain the diversity in the autism spectrum disorder? So to address this question, we design again the computational neural network model, which nicely integrate the Bayesian inference their idea. This is their, our, basically the recurrent neural network, but the uh, additional, the first additional function is the ability to predict not only the mean of the signal, but also the variance of the signal. Here, the signal uh, indicates the variance of the sensory signal. And then this, the mean and the variance is utilized to make their posterior. So here, the Bayesian inference module helps the network to integrate their incoming sensory input and their top-down predictions to make a posterior. And then with this model, we tested whether their hypoply hypothesis explain their autism spectrum disorders, the characteristic in the autism spectrum disorder, and then to what extent it can explain. And then we further investigated, maybe not only the hyperplier, but also hyperplier. This is another extreme case of their uh, prediction. This hyperplier may also provide their uh, account for their diverse behaviors in the autism spectrum disorders. So by manipulating the variance in the plier, we tested to what extent this idea can account for their uh, developmental disorders. Here is the one experiment uh, where we utilize their drawing as a cognitive task. The drawing is often used also in the child experiment because children cannot tell what they think or what they feel. So instead of asking Barbara, we can uh, extract their uh, internal model through their drawing behaviors. And using this drawing behavior, we first train the network here you can see the training data. We designed the six different the object, the trajectories, uh, which are represented in the XY space. And the differences between the six, uh, six trajectories were coded as a different initial state in the context layer. 
So which means that one single network can learn to reproduce six different trajectories just by changing their internal state, the initial state of the internal the state. And then the after training, we tested the network to see whether the network acquired their completions and the prediction ability. We provided only their first 33% of the trajectory and then let the network to make the prediction. This is an example. You can see that our black lines indicating their given trajectory, whereas the green parts showing their predicted parts. So the network needs to first infer what's the intended patterns, and then based on this intended pattern, the network continued to draw the missing parts. Yeah, you know, the question is how the modulations of their pliers, either the hyper plier or hyper plier, would affect the learning and also the drawing ability. This is the first result. We manipulated their parameter H from hyper plier to hyper plier. And these are the drawing performances. First, you can see that there with normal plier, the network somehow succeeded in reproducing the missing parts for face, house, cars, and power, and so on. So the network could prop could properly infer the intended the target patterns and then reproduce it, the missing parts. Yeah, the interesting the finding is the comparison between their hyperplier condition and hyperplier condition. First, please look at the hyperplier condition. In hyperplier condition, the network often misinterpreted the intended patterns. For example, there here, you can see that uh, this one, you can see that although their initial, the trajectory intended the car, but then the network understood or recognized this as a face because their outline was similar to the face. And then it continued drawing the face. Or this case, it was intended for rocket, but it looks like a human patterns because it also the initial part was similar to each other. When we design their hyperpliers, the different their difficulties were observed. So as you can see that the kind of split link, the missing parts was observed. The network could not infer the intended pattern and then completely failed in completing the missing parts. So the uh, statistical analysis of the drawing behavior nicely showed the U shape. So their vertical axis indicate the error. With hyperplier or hyperplier, we observe the higher error compared to the normal plier. So why this happens? Of course, we analyze the internal representation of the network in order to see how the network acquired the structural representation of the drawing, the different drawing patterns. This graph showing their uh, principal component analysis space of their context neurons. We had the one context layer, which contains the 100 neurons. And then we uh, analyzed the activations of the 100 neurons when we provided either face, house, or flower pattern. I want you to look at the bottom row which shows their uh, activations, the neural activations after their, uh, while the network producing their uh, completions, pattern, completion behaviors. First, please look at their uh, normal plier. With this case, you can see that their blue, yellow, and red lines are nicely distributed. Although the red and the yellow have some overlaps because the face and the house patterns are a bit similar to each other. But you can see that the three patterns are nicely, they're separated in the different clusters. Compared to this, their normal plier, you can see here with the hyper plier, the network was completely confused with the face and the house pattern. These two attractors were not separated, but it created just one attractor, which is the cause of the undifferentiated uh, or the misinterpretation of the intended pattern. 
And then there, in case of the hypoplier, we could not observe any the attractors in the network, which suggesting that this network completely fails in the completion ability in the representational drawing. This is still very uh, simple experiment, but now we also conducting their behavior experiment with the human children. So we can hope that we can nice compare the result from the network model with the human child. And as a last example, I'd like to share their, our, their uh, a little bit old study, which is their design of the Hetman display simulator, reproducing their atypical perception in autism spectrum disorder. Persons with autism spectrum disorders are often suffer from their hypersensory sensitivity. And this Hetman display can generate such a hypersensory sensitivity, like in this kind of the dotted noise in the image and also the high contrast in the image. This is still the, uh, not based on the network model or the predictive coding idea, but this simulator uh, shows what kind of the environment signal would affect their autism the perceptions. And then we are now working on their designing their computational network model, which replicate this atypical perception in ASD. And while they addressing this with this question, we found a very nice studies are uh, conducted by the Dr. Suzuki at UK. I guess the, some of you may remember that he also gave the talk in this their close lab their series, and he designed a very nice their uh, virtual reality system which can reproduce their uh, classic the psychedelic their hallucinations. They used their deep compression neural network, which was pre-trained with the many different types of the image, especially in this case, the animal images. And then after training the network, they uh, manipulated their effect of their top-down predictions. In some cases, they provided uh, they uh, enhanced the top-down predictions in only in the lower layer, or sometimes also from the higher layer. And this image showed the result of their uh, very strong top-down prediction from the highest layer. You can see that as an hallucinations, they're like an animal face, like in dogs or the cat can be observed in the image, which were created by the very strong top-down predictions. And they also found that these their uh, patterns are quantitatively similar to their experiences by the uh, psychiatric disorders. So I now there we are trying to utilize their ideas to also explain the, how their perception, atypical perception in autism spectrum disorders can be also generated by this deep convolutional network model and the predictive coding idea. So let me conclude my talk. So I started with the questions, what is the unified principle for the cognitive development? And then the, I introduced the idea of predictive coding self. The important idea is that this the process of the, uh, integrating the top-down prediction and the bottom-up sensation is uh, following the idea of the Bayesian inference. And first I showed that how this uh, non-social behavior or the internal model acquired through the non-social behavior can be utilized for the social behaviors. And we explained that the mirror neural system is a good example to show how the, our internal model can be utilized for the social interaction. Here I would like to explain how the mirror neural system can be accounted for based on the Bayesian model. When we, after we uh, first acquire the internal model, we now observe their other person's behaviors. So which mean that there we have the limited sensations. In this case, the limited sensation is expressed at their uh, huge the Gaussian distribution with the large variance. With this, the sensory signal, we cannot well estimate the internal state of the others because we have uncertainty in our perceptions or posteriors. With the mirror neural system, I showed that their network model, which is based on the mirror neural system, can uh, make their imaginary the sensory signal. 
based, for example, based on the incoming the visual signal, the network can reconstruct corresponding proprioceptive and their tactile signals. This imaginary signal could give their uh, more accurate the sensory signal. And this more accurate sensory signals, of course, could lead to their more accurate the perceptions. So their functions of the mirror neural system is now nicely explained as a change in the accuracy on the perception by generating their imaginary sensor signal based on the mirror neural system, we can acquire the better and more accurate the perception about their other persons, their uh, goal, their behavioral intention. And then the, as for their uh, diversity in the development, I showed you some of the computational studies. They're suggesting that not only hypo priors, but also hyper priors might explain that different, there are difficulties in autism spectrum disorders. Some persons with developmental disorders have weak generalization abilities, or some have their poor adaptabilities. These different the difficulties could be explained, can be explained by the different underlying mechanism based on the predictive coding. This is still the very first step. And uh, this slide is also still new. We just, I just recently, uh, these days, uh, tried to summarize our, our findings. So I'm happy to receive your comments on the ideas or the hypothesis. And also I hope that this the summary would help you to uh, design the new experiment to test the idea. This is a very final slide. I just uh, emphasize again the two keywords. That's the predictive coding, which provide the unified account for the cognitive development, and also the diversity in the, uh, the individual. Their difficulties can be explained not only by the hypoplier and the hyperpliers. So thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm happy to receive your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe we can we can uh, all unmute uh, to, to clap for <laughs> in, with real hands for a short moment. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Yukia, uh, for a great talk. I'm sure we have uh, a lot of questions. I want to invite uh, those who are on YouTube um, and to uh, to join the Zoom if they like. Um, so that's probably easier for, for uh, questions. You can also speak them if, you, if you'd like. Otherwise, um, here's again the, the link uh, in both chats. Uh, you can see the link to uh, the Slido. So we can uh, ask the questions over there when you're ready. Um, and uh, did I post it on YouTube? I'll quickly check. Uh, yeah, it's also in there. So we, yeah, if you have yeah, any question, uh, feel free to uh, to ask them. Um, okay, so there's a first one. Maybe I have a, a first question and, and take my, my priority as a host. Um, so uh, let's see. Well, yeah, there, there are many things. I, I, I really like this word because it, it, uh, it connects uh, yeah, different, different parts of, uh, of, I guess, uh, what is cognitive science. Um, it's really interesting to see that discrepancies in the um, higher level of uh, of cognition, or or I guess a hierarchical model, depending on which model you use uh, in the brain, uh, somehow connect to um, different yeah di di well this diversity in terms of autism. So uh, I I guess yeah does that connect uh, to to a sort of uh, what is the discrepancy also in terms of metacognition? Is that directly connected to that or, or is that too general? Yeah, I think the metacognition is very important. The, our current model is still very simple. It has, a, for example, the only the one layers for the predictions and we don't consider the hierarchical the predictions yet. And we know that there, uh, of course, the, the higher layer prediction, for example, the uh, if, if we have the prediction error, but if we can properly predict the prediction error itself, we are not surprised. So the hierarchical model, the, also the metacognition would be necessary for model such an, uh, yeah more higher level or sophisticated level of the cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. mm. I see. Good. Um, so yeah, we have a, a 
question from Trish Toft. And before that, maybe Yukia, if you could uh, share your your on your screen the um, the Slido uh, link. Slido. Maybe mm -hmm. you can in the chat. Do you still have the link? Yep. This way we can see. Yeah. So feel free to post questions via Slido.com. And in the meantime, maybe Trish Toft, you, you want to ask a question live? I have so many questions. Thank you for for a fascinating talk. Um, so I, I've been wondering. So the um, the difference between the, um, the the prior, whether we have the hypo prior or the hyper prior, um, and in in a typical developmental person versus a person with uh, autism spectrum disorder can account for um, for these differences in in perception. But the the, the the question that popped into my mind is how how does the difference how how does this uh, this difference arise? Uh, where, where does it really come from? Um, do you have any hypothesis as to how people with ASD actually acquire this sort of differences? And mm. the second sort of follow-up to this question is that, um, you know, to me, it sounds like an extremely plausible model of what uh, what happens with the people with uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, that, so the next question is like, okay, so if we know that this is the case, how do we shift their priors uh, to be, uh, to have higher variance, to have uh, more normal, uh, distribution so that they acquire much more, uh, you know, standard perception. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting and important questions. As for the first point, the, uh, how the difference occurs uh, between the uh, hypopliers and hypopliers. The recent studies from my project member, not my lab, but the project members showed that the uh, balance between the excitatory neurons and the inhibitory neurons is the balance between these two is uh, modified, then it re result in the hypoplier or hyperplier. Yeah, so that it influences the precision in the prediction. The EI balance, the excitatory and inhibitory neuron balance is well known the neural the characteristic in the autism spectrum disorders. There are some studies suggest that the person with ASD have their uh, more the inhibitory neurons or stronger inhibitory influences, which might be why they cannot well they uh, integrate the information. Or some studies actually show their uh, contradictory their result. But their common uh, uh, idea or their understanding is that imbalance between the excitatory and inhibitory seems to be the core mechanism of their uh, different the precision in the predictions. So now we Yes, we have the same question where the differences come from. And then we now went back to the uh, EI balance, which could result in a difference in the uh, accuracy of the predictions. Now we are thinking where this EI balance is coming from. Some of their uh, biology studies suggesting that there is the manipulation of the genes could result in the EI imbalance. So, think that their predictive coding, the differences in the predictive coding could will explain by the EI balance and further the change in the modifications in the gene as well. And uh, sorry, I forgot the second the question. Could you repeat? Yes. Um, so the second part was mm -hmm. like if we if we know that the, these these distributions uh, their their sort of shift is, uh, is is what's causing the problem. So mm -hmm. how do we correct it um, in in a person with uh, you know autism spectrum disorder? Mm -hmm. I think there are persons that typically developed persons can easily switch between their uh, normal hypo or hyperplia depends on their own their uh, internal model and also their environmental signal. The problems in ASD seems to be the switch between the hypo or hyper. It seems that according to the uh, self report from the person with ASD, they have the two different aspects. They sometimes have the very strong fire. They don't care so much about their external signal, but sometimes they have the very narrow focus and then they a kind of closed mind. So they cannot that well adapt to the environment signal. So the, how uh, smoothly we can switch between the different types of the prior is the more important uh, characteristic in the uh, SD. So then the uh, one idea is to uh, have the, the, again, the hierarchies in the predictive coding. So that 
higher levels would control whether it should have their hypo or hyper their bias in the lower layers. So the, such a hierarchical the architecture would be necessary to study the switching between the different types of the bias. Yeah, this you. is very, yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah, very interesting topic. Um, yeah, maybe Rania, I think, had, a, had the next question. Uh, Rania, would you like to ask it here? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I have a question about the first part for the uh, architecture of autoencoder um, uh, deep network. Uh, does, uh, was it trained online or offline? And does it allow for incremental learning, like after the robot mm -hmm. learned from this observation and predict predictive error? Uh, can uh, if he observed new uh, information to adapt or that need to retrain the network? In our experiment, we use the offline learning. We first collected the training data and then they uh, provided the data to the network, the step by step. Then the, when we test the network performance, we uh, made a, like an, uh, every like a hundred step that we tested the performance of the network. So we train the network with the uh, first hundred data and then we test the performance of the predicts. And then we provided the next hundred data and then we again tested the performance. So it's a kind of the simulating the online learning. It's not actual online learning, but the process is similar to the online learning. We gradually increased the numbers of the training. And uh, in this case, does the uh, network size adaptable or it is uh, prefixed? Mm -hmm. We fixed their network size, and uh, in this experiment, we did not look at their kind of the developmental increase of their network capacity or something. We fixed the network size, we fixed their uh, also the sensor signal, the acuity of the sensor signal, and then just gradually increase the numbers of the training data. But it's possible to do such an experiment as well to better see the uh, effect of the development. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we have uh, the next question is a composed question, I guess. Uh, something happened. Sorry, as I moved to my <laughs> window, maybe you see that something is strange. <laughs> Let me share the screen again. Yeah. Can you see? And uh, yeah, so I don't know who asked the next question. Uh, if they if they're not here, I'll simply read it. So uh, thank you for the very informative talk. Um, I have a concern question. The predictive coding presented model seems to imply the brain capacity to generate priors corresponding to all objects of the world together with all their variations. Uh, this does not seem plausible. Uh, how can this be conciliated with predictive coding theory? Hmm. Sorry, let me take some time to understand the question. Me too, I'm, I'm kind of confused. Um, I, I have a potential comment on, on, on this topic. Sure, no, <laughs> so, uh, um, Jeff Hawkins of Numenta, uh, which is a small privately held uh, research lab uh, from Redwood City in California, they have a very interesting theory about how brain represents information using uh, sparse distributed representations. And based on their ideas, the brain's capacity for, you know, generating different, for storing different kinds of representations is, for all practical purposes, infinite. The, the number of representations for objects of any kind that the brain can have based on sparse distributed representations far exceeds the number of um, atoms in the observable universe. So um, uh, it's, not implausible, it's not entirely implausible that the brain can actually generate every single possible object that could exist mm -hmm. and their variations. And this is especially true that the laws of nature are actually very constrained. So the variations are constrained as well. Um, the, the universe that we actually exist in is, is highly non-random, it's extremely highly structured. I see. Yeah, 
in our experiment, we use a rather simpler model. So that might be why this question arises. So that our analysis of the internal representation of the network uh, might give you the impression that the network there acquired their distributed representation for each the object independently. But again, there if we have the hierarchical neural network model, like you know, for example, the multiple time scale recurrent neural network model, which can acquire the hierarchical structure. For example, the uh, primitives of their object, for example, their circle, square, or something, there are certain primitives are represented in the lower layer, and then the higher layer learns the composition of such a primitives. And then, for example, that by integrating the circle with, I don't know, some the lines and something, it can create a face like the object in the higher layer. So the network does not need, does not represent the all different object independently. They have their, they can have their hierarchical structure, which can share their common representation in the lower layer. Mm -hmm. Does yeah, it make this, sense? This might be, yeah, this might be connected to also, uh, yeah, I was wondering about different senses and uh, well, maybe different tasks also uh, that would involve uh, either auditory or, or maybe uh, some kind of motor or, or different kinds of tasks. Maybe that changes everything. But here, mm -hmm. I guess it's important that to, to, to see that this is not um, this is not directly cognitive. It's again, I think, uh, metacognitive in the sense of uh, acting at different levels of this uh, uh, hierarchical uh, system. Um, so within that, it's actually, yeah, it's not actually acting directly on predictions. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's, I guess, uh, uh, it's about uh, perceptions of perceptions, or uh, you know, uh, thinking about thinking kind of thing. Um, so uh, I guess, yeah, I guess maybe that's where the, the question was pointing. I'm, I'm not completely sure. Uh, what do you think about um, different types of uh, uh, tasks for, for, for this? Um, would you see a lot of variation um, over, yeah, let's say something very visual or something that is, uh, that requires maybe object rotation, something like that? Um, yeah. We when we integrate the much model signals, we acquire the uh, representation in the higher layer to integrate the much model signals, and then there it acquires a kind of symbolic representation or a model representation of the event or action or an object. Such a symbolic representation would help to also share the represent acquired representation in the brain. Yeah, for example, the uh, some symbols which are learned from the visual their signals could be also utilized for inferring their auditory signal or the tactile signals. So the merge model representation also the key the mechanism to have their such an uh, overlapped and then still distributed their and shared representations in the network. Mm -hmm. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe I have, yeah, I have to think a bit about about uh, about this, but uh, yeah, maybe let's take uh, Anne's question. Um, so, have you tried to combine two different sensory inputs, uh, for example, visual and auditory? And sorry if already mentioned, yeah, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. and uh, the second part is which of the two. Uh, sorry, which of two emotions or maybe more than two emotions are the most difficult uh, ones to distinguish uh, from each other? And what was the solution for your, uh, yeah, I guess, for your model to overcome? Yeah, for the first questions, I imagine that this different mean that kind of conflict that sensory input not just the two different the modalities. For example, the in the vision, it shows their happy face, but the speech, the audio signal is representing the uh, angry, their state. Does it the meaning of the different sensory input or just the modality, the difference in the modalities? If in the former case that we haven't tried, 
we always provided the uh, consistent the sensory signal between the modalities. The happy face always comes with their happy the speech and so on. So if we provide their, uh, such a conflicting, inconsistent multimodal signals to the network, I think the network just failed in acquiring the internal representation or it's just the uh, over the distributed, over differentiate the different modality. For example, the happy state and the anger state and the happy plus anger state. So which is will be recognized as a completely different state or the come some overlap between happy and anger. Mm. And the, uh, as for the second question, the most difficult emotion to distinguish. Yes, they, uh, in our experiment, we found that the negative emotion corresponding to the disgust and the fear and also sadness, these emotional states were very difficult to differentiate because uh, we use a very simple uh, signals from the vision and speed. As for the vision, we use the position and the velocity of their uh, the, some of their visual feature, like an eyebrows movement or their eye, uh, mouth and nose and something like that. And also from the speech signal, we uh, extracted their amplitude, pitch and so on, so on. So no the context information. So with this the information, it's very hard to differentiate, the, especially the negative emotion, fear, sadness and disgust, because they share a lot of their uh, similar features like a low pitch voice and also their, uh, how can you say, they're not their smile, but their this shape of the mouth movement or also their uh, wrist movement in their facial expression. So such a common the features extracted from the negative emotions make their uh, difficulties in the differentiation. But interestingly, these difficulties can be also found in the human emotion recognition. There are many studies that examining how well the person can differentiate their facial expression as speech signal from another person's. And such a behavior study also showed that the pre people have difficulties in differentiating the negative emotions. So I think that their network, their difficulties was nicely analogous to the uh, humans, their behavioral patterns. Mm. Very interesting. So before Kai's question, uh, I was wondering if, uh, if this, uh, so you talk about the the diversity, which I find really interesting in ASD, mm -hmm. uh, and well, diversity itself uh, in complex systems is something you can get uh, very often for different, very different reasons, uh, for free sometimes, and also uh, well, scale free effects and, and, and things like this. Uh, I wonder what kind of diversity and maybe how easy it is to get diversity. So what? makes your model so so your model shows these uh, this this nice diversity that is caused by something that is in my mind at least very plausible um mm -hmm. but what makes it you know a, a better model uh, for esd you know like for this diversity in esd if that makes sense so what versus mm -hmm. maybe something completely different that might also get that uh yeah how you know how uh, how much would we bet on on this kind of model I'm sorry, ma'am. I cannot really get to your point. The how? Yeah, but, mm. yeah. So the betting thing is a joke, but I mean, uh, you know, mm. uh, we can get maybe this diversity uh, mm -hmm. in with a di completely different model. Uh, mm. Why? Why should I put money, uh, quote unquote, on on uh, on this kind of predictive coding instead of something else that can also get mm. diverse? Mm. The one reason is that there, uh, in my project, I collaborate closely with the person with autism spectrum disorders. And we have their uh, studies called first person study. The researchers who have autism spectrum disorders study themselves, how, what difficulties they have in their daily life and what difficulties they have in the communications or perception and so on. And they study their own perception from the first person perspective. And this study provides us a very say, a new insight into the underlying mechanism of their autism difficulties. There, we conduct the thematic analysis of their uh, subjective report. 
we collect the subjective report from the person with autism and we analyze what are the common difficulties uh, regardless of the modalities or regardless of the, uh, like the context. And then we found that there something related to the predictive coding, like a sensitivity to the prediction error or sensitivity to supplies is a one that they, 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 uh, common their uh, inference or common features in the autism and also there are some difficulties in the uh, integrating the multi model signal. So it's a common characteristics were observed and extracted from the self report from the autism spectrum disorder. That's mm -hmm. why we think that the predictive coding so far is a nice starting point for us to test the our hypothesis. Of course, I agree with you that there might be the another theory or another uh, hypothesis to better explain their differences, their diversity in the autism. But as from my experiences, the so far the predictive coding is the most plausible for me. That's why I first focused only on the predictive coding and then investigate to what extent this predictive coding can provide us a unified account for our human brain. Sure, thank you. Yeah, uh, also I, I must say that this kind of question is not always productive, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if you, <laughs> I'm not really offering like uh, ch championing any other model. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's really fair. And also I really appreciate the, the study with, with, uh, with real patients or, or subjects uh, with, uh, with a tool that actually uh, has, has come some kind of effect that you can uh, have a control on. So it's uh, really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the next uh, question from someone, I don't know if someone is in the room for that question, uh, otherwise I'll read it. Um, can you train your neural net with data sets that have different sensory inputs? Okay, so people are like that kind of uh, direction. I, I also, yeah, it's slightly different, I guess, from the, the other question. Um, so yeah, data sets what, that have what different- What does this mean here, the different sensory inputs? Yeah, I guess, it, yeah, if it's uh, senses, uh, touch, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the person is not here to precise, I would assume that it's uh, maybe, yeah, either modality. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, instead of using the visual tactile proprioceptive, we, whether we can train the network with audio, I don't know, interceptive sensation or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> if we yeah. can have such an sensory signals, of course, the our model is the ideas of our model is very general. So the how the multimodal signals can be integrated, so that the model can also reconstruct their bottom up sensory signal. So based on these ideas, any the coming that's in any sensory signals, not only the extraceptive sensation, but also the interceptive sensation, which we are really focusing on now. Can be also should be also integrated in this architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentally put an S to inputs, and to me it was like, uh, does it present any extra difficulty if you mix sensory inputs? Mm. Maybe that's mm. not what. We, uh, yeah, I'm also unsure. I think the way we mix the different the modality signals is you know another question. With our current model, with the deep autoencoder, we integrated the different modality signals already from the bottom up layer. But then the, mm -hmm. in the emotion experiment, we connected the different modalities only in the highest layer. We tested mm -hmm. several different ideas to combine everything together from the bottom up or only on the top layers. The results slightly different, but then the core, their message does not change. So that's why that we just selected one of them and then the explain how their prediction, the multi model, their representation of prediction which their help for their social behavior mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Kai, you are in the room. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, hopefully it's not too noisy here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Um, yeah, so I guess under the sort of active inference or predictive coding framework, then there's also an idea of having preferences or where these priors might be on the sort of sensory inputs that you expect. So within the broader 
uh, spectrum of cognitive development, what do you think are um, the sort of preferences that people and children have? Do you mean there like a preference for the visual signals compared to the tactile or auditory signal? Or the preference in the one modality signal? Preferences within any modality. So if you believe mm -hmm. at vision that they like visual complexity or colors or at a higher level, mm -hmm. if if they want uh, you know, empowerment mm -hmm. or social interaction. Mm -hmm. It depends on the, what kind of cognitive behaviors you are looking at. For some, the cognitive behaviors, for example, the vision is more important than the audio signals, or for others, the tactile is more important than the other modality signals. And then the importance or the preference should be determined based on their sensory signal itself, I think. If the sensory signal have their uh, prominent information there, then we will have the higher preferences or higher priorities on utilizing their certain, certain sensory signal. So we, we might, the simple quick answer is that, uh, yes, of course, there is such a preference would contribute to the cognitive development, but the certain preference should be determined in a bottom-up manner based on the sensory signal and also their desired task. Do I answer to your question? Uh, yes, and, and do, you, do you have any sorts of uh, thoughts about what higher, higher tasks um, are important? Sorry, could you tell again? Higher. Uh, yes, do you, what sort of higher tasks do you think are important? Higher task. You said that uh, uh -huh. this is, is mainly driven bottom up, so reducing uncertainty, um, but also uh -huh. dependent on the task that the uh -huh. agent is doing. So what sort of tasks do you think are interesting? Oh, uh, what I'm interested in is they're more like a motor their behaviors, which could, uh, which enable their robot or the network models to interact with their environment and also their social partners. The perception is just not kind of their passive, their processes. It doesn't actively their, yeah, behave in the environment. So we looking at their, how the motor behaviors which uh, the cognitive the motor behaviors could be achieved by the predictive coding and then what modality signals may better contribute to the touching uh, motor abilities. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, another question from Anne um, that starts, I think, here. Uh, Anne, actually, I think you're here. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so like, I'll, I'll just like thinking because, okay, uh, for your information, I'm not really about AI or like this neural network field, uh, ba ba uh, ba basic knowledge. So I was just thinking like, uh, uh, so your, your model is ba basically about predicting uh, mm -hmm. something, right? Some ne next action. So I was thinking if you, you can stop intentionally uh, training your model and make it up to the like three-year-old boy, boy or girl then uh, if you can make it like uh, make your model to anticipate the, the the behavior or action of that that uh, you know model then uh, if you have like multiple model about that uh, you know three-year-old boy's uh, mm -hmm. smartness then uh, we can tr uh, we can test some some kind of dangerous situation to the to your model, and maybe you know we we adults can anticipate or prevent uh, the, that kind of uh, you know dangerous situation for our three old baby. You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I did I explain it pretty bad? I, I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, okay. I think I get your point. Okay. So in right. our Sorry, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your uh, question. So in our experiment, we always determine when to stop the training. 
we usually uh, look at their errors in the predictions. And then if this uh, decrease in their errors somehow converges, if we don't see their further improvement, we basically stop the training. The reason why we need to intentionally stop the training is that if we just continue the training, you will observe the overfitting in the model. So the network becomes too specific to their uh, given task. And then it loses the generalization capabilities. So we, when we, you conduct the network training, we have to properly design when to stop the training and what criteria we should use to determine when to stop. And interesting point is that if we continue the training, as I said, the network often produces the overfitting to a specific task. And, but I think that there's such an overfitting, the characteristics is similar to their, some, their behavior characteristic in the autism spectrum disorders. Because the persons with autism spectrum disorders uh, also often have their very specific knowledge, and then they don't have their uh, enough generalization capability. They can learn their each specific task very nicely, but then they cannot uh, adapt their knowledge acquired from this task to their similar task, but a little bit different task. This the generalization capability is very important for the further development. So I think that their, uh, their scheduling of the learning is a very important their issues when we conduct this kind of the network experiment. And as for the second part, they, I think that it's very interesting idea to test what happens with the, like a three year old network or two years old network. We have not really uh, tested such an experiment. One reason is that uh, we, uh, our network model can not learn yet their much di completely different behaviors at first. We designed the network for one task and then we designed another network for another task. But our human brain share uh, their, this network for many different tasks. So this such an uh, diverse abilities to learn that did many different the behaviors in one network is necessary to conduct the experiment that you suggested. But I think it's very important there are future issues we should address in this uh, developmental robotics community. Thank you. I mean, uh, I'm very happy that me, my, my naive thinking might help you guys. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a, uh, yeah, dramatically, uh, exciting question of uh, of how to tackle uh, generalization in the brain and uh, one one big path i guess in uh, in ai has been uh, to to achieve some kind of yeah higher level of meta learning uh, mm -hmm. so i talked about metacognition now i talk about another meta um, and i guess meta learning uh, is yeah is uh, is connected to well to some extent to the, this uh, physiological effect of uh, of what is it like failing to not predict but failing to uh, uh, to modulate those those neurons like or sets of neurons uh, what is it like a bit like meta variables uh, meta knobs uh, uh, those can be synaptic weights I guess um, at specific levels of your hierarchy uh, so so mm -hmm. I don't know maybe the cortex but maybe not only the cortex um, mm -hmm. and yeah so so how how does that do you think that relates uh, strongly? Can, can can you and can you imagine like an experiment that will uh, like have a new algorithm for meta learning? Like ultimately from mm -hmm. these experiments, Let, let's think about crazy stuff. <laughs> what, what <do> you think? <laughs> What's yeah, the... that, mm, yeah, that would be a very very nice and interesting uh, next uh, research topic. The, unfortunately, there our current their network model is still very limited. So their, when their network model can show the very, very nice, their, for example, their, uh, their image recognition abilities, but it's just only for the image recognition, nothing about the motor generation and so forth. So I think the next challenge for their AI research, especially the neural networks research, is to design the, how the certain general the intelligence can be acquired through their 
many different types of their uh, experiences, not only the perception, but also the motor behaviors, social interaction, and so on, so on. I think still that is still a big open challenge for the all AI researchers. I'm not yeah. sure whether we can just simply extend our the existing model or we may need the completely new ideas for the network model. Right. But those experiments, I guess, could could feed you some kind of ideas. I, I'd be yeah, I'd be curious to to look dig a bit more into uh, into your publications. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess yeah, one idea is uh, to have more than one network. I guess something that we've been discussing a lot with Good AI, uh, with their with their Badger model, which connects like basically many neural networks mm -hmm. instead of just one. I wonder what what uh what your work here, like some kind of predictive uh, coding approach, would would do to that. Uh, if you if you had more than one network and tried to meta learn like overdose, uh, yeah, that would be one thing. And I guess like I was thinking also about some work we're doing. Uh, you mentioned Keisuke Suzuki and his hallucination model, uh, and I, I guess you mentioned uh, Alex Modvintsev like on the same slide. And now I can't remember which work you were mentioning, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that's uh, that's also something we, we've been discussing with Keisuke about some uh, mm -hmm. some work exactly on on actually um, well I guess some kind of meta learning and surprise um, mm -hmm. yeah so, so essentially we're interested in this kind of subjective reality that can have a discrepancy and how to induce it uh, so I guess yeah that, that's something uh, to discuss about maybe I, I, when I visit your lab I, I present some of that um, mm -hmm. yeah I think we have one last question from Christoph and then we'll go offline. So that people who are a bit shy, more shy, like can can also talk. Um, yeah, Christoph, you have the 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 ending word. So I, I was wondering about the idea of uh, generalization in the in the brain, right? Like in the in the human brain, the um, uh, to prevent overfitting, that that will be the role of neurotransmitters, right? Like the um, if you're um, actively engaged in some task and um, neurotransmitters modulate uh, plasticity of the mm -hmm. uh, of the neurons and at every single level of the um, organization and so on, at some point, if your um, uh, if your error uh, decreases to uh, some sort of negligible uh, ne negligible amount, then the neurotransmitters essentially uh, stop flowing and you essentially get bored of the task and 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 you move on, right? So mm -hmm. I, want, I was wondering, again, like in, in context of the autism spectrum disorder, although uh, I must admit that my um, firsthand experience is not with uh, ASD specifically, but with Asperger. Almost everybody mm -hmm. I know and work with uh, has some sort of degree of Asperger, uh, which is kind of not uncommon in the software development field. Um, wouldn't it be uh, fair to say that, you know, like the, the, the Asperger people's inability uh, or, or limited uh, interoceptive focus, the, the ability to mm -hmm. say what's happening within the system, particularly how the neurotransmitters are actually affecting the system um, mm -hmm. is what's causing them to essentially overfit or, or, or just, uh, you know, like push through these boundaries because they they can get into this sort of, this and, and talks, also talking sort of from experience, we, we can get to, to this mode where, you know, it, there, there, there is no stop. <laughs> like if something mm -hmm. gets if something gets me interested, I will sacrifice just about everything, uh, you know, to, to to get to the bottom of it. And there's absolutely no stopping uh, in in the system. Uh, do you think that's a it's a it's a plausible uh, explanation for why this sort of overfitting mm -hmm. can happen? I think that's a very in, uh, interesting and then nice ideas to focus on the neurotransmitters. I remember now that there are uh, my colleagues they're working on their behavior studies on their autism and their schizophrenia also suggested that the neurotransmitters that are controlling the how the precise their our prediction is and also the which influences their learning itself. So I think there are not only their like a genetic their uh, influences on their prediction, but also the neurotransmitter would be their Another the important factor we should uh, integrate in the predictive coding account. Uh, I As think Carl, Carl, in, oh, in, sorry, I, I just yeah. want to say that I think Carl Friston in one of his papers mentions that um, neuro, the, the 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 overarching role of neurotransmitters is essentially controlling precision in mm. different in different ways. Yeah. Like dopamine would be temporal precision, um, mm. acetylcholine would be something else. And but mm. at the end of the day, in terms of predictive coding or the active inference models, it, it all boils down to the precision parameter as you go across different hierarchies. 
Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, Carol Friston's the idea is very nicely explained the how the uh, precision of the predictions is the controlled by the certain new calf meters and then also the uh, Okistokin level. And then the, the, as far as I know, there, I, no one has really integrated the, uh, such an idea in the neural network modeling. I think that in the reinforcement learning field, there are many people that are working on the dopamine system or certain neural modulations, but then the, the person working on this computational neural network model based on the predictive coding. Yeah, I think that, yeah, no one has still they addressed such a research question. So that might be the very interesting, the new topic that you or we could address. Mm. Yeah, I got a like, suggestion to, uh, to, to get your hands dirty. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a tremendously uh, exciting topic. Huh? So uh, I mm -hmm. think that, that has been like, uh, I think predictive coding is, is becoming more prominent these days. And, uh, but, but here is a very precise like application. It's so rich uh, because of the problem you apply it to. I think this, the richness comes really from the problem. Uh, the, the idea is, is pretty though from, from Carl Friston and uh, I, I don't know if it's Chris Frith or uh, who, uh, who, who, who did this like uh, or talked about this application but uh, yeah I guess yeah the, this general like uh, application to uh, um, like uh, what is it synthesis of, of uh, uh, percepts um, uh, into a metacognition like uh, kind of like at, at different levels of the hierarchy is the key idea. So you can, if you can apply that and be successful, that's uh, that's really, yeah, very impressive results. Mm -hmm. um, all right, uh, I think we are going to uh, uh, go uh, offline now, and we'll continue chatting a little bit. So people who want to join us uh, on the on the Zoom link, uh, please write down the Zoom link before it disappears from the chat, and you'll have to refresh the page. Uh, and yeah, we'll uh, therefore end the screen. Uh, thank you so much, Yuki and Agai, for joining us. This was a, a real pleasure, a very nice talk. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more. Uh, we'll share uh, maybe the link of uh, your lab and some of your work, uh, that's okay, uh, down the YouTube description after the event ends. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for the very nice discussions. Thank you. And uh, I'll now